Hi, and welcome to Kangaroos, the podcast where we provide you incredibly local content for our incredible local realtors. Today, we have a very fun episode, but first, Rachel, what do we have? We have the question of the day, which Mm. is, (laughs) you laugh before we even say it. Yeah. What's the best time you've had at an amusement park? Oh, man. Um, I... One, I, I don't like amusement parks in general. Um, I don't, I haven't been in a really long time. I don't enjoy falling. I don't enjoy, uh, I enjoy horizontal speed, like driving fast, flying, those type of things. But as soon as you start dropping me off of things, I don't really care for it. Man, I was probably eight or nine, pretty young. And my dad and my uncle uh, were at Six Flags over Texas, and we decide to do the shockwave, which is a double loop of a roller coaster. And it was, you know, at that point, it was for the big kids. And I was a little, a little guy. And we stand in line. We're having a good time. We sit down in the seat and it starts clicking up that first hill. And I turn to my dad and I say, Dad, I don't think I want to do this. And my dad says, it's a little late. It's a little late for that. And then my uncle turned around. who's sitting in front of us and said, Andrew, I don't want to do this either. And then we did the roller coaster. It was so much fun. Um, but that that story has lived on in Hudson lore for many a year. What was the best time you've ever had in amusement park? Like you, amusement parks aren't really my thing. If I have time, I'd rather go to a beach. I was trying to remember the last time I went to Kings Island. I think that's outside of Cincinnati, right? In college. I'm not sure it's the best time. It's just the last time I can remember going to an amusement park, which has been a very long time ago, unfortunately, sadly. We did go as a church group to, oh, what's the big amusement park? It, the name is just totally Dis- flown out of Disney my head. World. No, it's not Universal. Disney World. Nope. It's in Ohio, I think. Cedar Point. Okay. That was that was a lot of fun, but I was with a lot of friends. Maybe this is a bad question of the day because neither one of us <laughs> like amusement parks. <laughs> but I'm sure lots of you out there can just reminisce about your favorite roller coaster you've ever ridden. I don't like heights. And I also do not like falling. See, I love so, heights. I could stand up ugh. on top of a tower all day. As nope. soon as you tell me to jump off, I'm like, why we, no, Why am I going to jump off this? This is mm-hmm. so dumb. I don't like heights. It makes my legs ache when I'm somewhere high. I'm terrified of flying heights. Anything that puts me way up into the sky off of the ground. I don't like it. So I bungee jumped in high school off of 110 feet, 11 stories tall. And we had to climb all 11 flights of stairs. And by the time you get to the top, at least I was super winded. uh, And I stood at the edge of the little ledge. Stood at the edge of the ledge. (laughs) Yeah. Sure. Uh, And I'm like, I don't want to do this. And the guy's like, you have to, you can't, you can't go back down the stairs. I was like, I think that's a dumb rule. And on the video, I squat down first before I jump because that little, you know, two feet lower (laughs) is better. Um, But there was this giant air mattress underneath where you would, you know, if you were, if the cord were to break, you would land on this air mattress. So a safety precaution. And um, I jump and it's pretty great. I never want to do it again. But what they didn't tell me is like the initial jump you were ready for. But when you bounce and then you catch weightlessness, I was not ready for that. And that's the one that scared me. Um, But, you know, I get off, they unhook me and the dude 11 flights up doesn't want to go back down the stairs. And so he just jumps into the air mattress and then walks off. And you're like, huh? Yeah, that's a different, different way of getting down. But all that to say, welcome to the podcast, Rachel. Yeah, that, no, I would never do that. I would skydive before I would bungee jump. 
it's something about like you already know that you're going and there's no that snapback thing and there's no cord that can break. It's just, I mean, I guess your parachute could fail, but it's just well, you got two of them? anyway, two of them. What? You two have parachutes. two parachutes. Yeah. And you have to tandem dive. So you're not by yourself if it's your first time and those people know what they're doing. So all those things. Anyway, those that's giant why we're swings here. that you see too. I would no, never I do those. I, Gosh, nope. no. Mm-mm. Nope. Zero nope. percent. Let's talk about our one minute marketing term. <laughs> Growth marketing. Pretty simple because it is what it sounds like, but it is how you are going to increase your or your influence um, and results within a specific targeted group of people. So you would build tactics to grow in a certain segment of audience. So you are attempting to grow your market share. Super simple, super straightforward. I am trying to grow. So what's the strategy you're going to use to increase your market? Good. Yep. Kind of relates to what we're going to talk about today. What are we talking about? In defining my audience or your, Mm. whoever, your audience, you're going to learn how to define it. So I think that we have definitely talked about this in all of our two previous episodes at this point that we've recorded, but I think we're going to get a little bit more tactical today. So first, why is this important? Whenever I got into marketing, uh, it was drilled into me that the very, very first question you should always ask is who's your audience? Because if you don't know who you're going after, you don't know what message to say. You don't know uh, what persona you should have. Like you don't know who you're going after. You don't know what to do. So, um, understanding who your audience is, how they think, what makes them tick, uh, narrow, narrow niche marketing is always going to be more successful. Right. Also, I think, and you've touched, you touched on all those things, but in order to define an audience, they have to have a problem or a need that you're going to fulfill. And so if you don't know what that is for yourself, you don't know how to reach people. So it all all works together. But also um, we've talked about how this, you don't want to waste time using methods of communication that aren't going to reach your target. So for instance, you and I have both talked about how we hate when people come to our door and it really (laughs) doesn't matter what you're selling. I don't want you to come to my front door. Yeah. The door to door salesman. I just don't see how that is good for anybody. I don't think it is. I have a lot of admiration for the people that do it because that is very hard work that not many people would want to do. So I think that if you've committed to doing that, you're a hard worker. So kudos, but I just hate when people come straight to my home to try to sell me something. It feels like a violation of sorts because my home is like my peaceful place where I don't want to be sold anything, even though I am because I'm on my phone or I'm watching TV and those people sell me stuff all the time, but they're not (laughs) coming into my house. So that's just a basic example. I mean, we could get more targeted, but as a realtor, most likely most likely you're not going to do that. I laugh only because I think sometimes you do go knock on a door and be like, Hey, I've got a client in this market that loves your house. And are you, have you ever thought about selling it? I would say that that that's an exception to the rule because this market's crazy and there's just not enough inventory at the moment. So, so one thing we talk a ton about is efficiencies and effectiveness. So if you don't know who your audience is, you're going to waste a lot of time trying to figure out what message you're going to craft to this humongous audience uh, or even an audience you don't, you don't know. Um, And so just for the sake of efficiencies and effectiveness, you need to define who you're going after. As a caveat, as a realtor, you do serve everyone. So while that is true and that you would never turn anyone away if they 
asked you for your services, you, there are people you are just more apt to work with because of the experience you have, the location you're in, who you've worked with in the past, et cetera. Even so, still, I, I, while I agree, uh, even still your audience could be narrowed down a little bit to even just like people that are in the market. Like, yeah, I'm exactly. not looking to buy a house right now. And so would you be wasting your marketing spend on someone like me? Or are you looking for qualified buyers and qualified sellers? Now, again, the caveat, we're full of caveats today. I know. I was would, just would, be, say. would be that it's the long game. And so I'm yep. not interested right now, but am I going to be interested in a year from now or in two years? And then I need to know who the best realtor is. Yeah. I think that brings us to another point, which is really oh. important is building long-term relationships with you your go. audience is important. So that's right. corporately in our backgrounds, we've worked for a lot of corporations. So we would talk about brand loyalty as a way to describe this similarly. So we are establishing our brand. We establish the values of our brand, what we stand for, the storytelling that we use all uh, points back to those things that we've established. And so when our customers have a need that relates to any of those values, they automatically think of us um, in the same way realtors do that. So like you just said, it's a long game. I talk about things online. I share stories of people um, who have closed with me or found the perfect house, even in this crazy market. And so a year from now when I'm thinking, oh, now's the best time for me to sell because of all these reasons, I'm going to think of Rachel because she has said all these things for the past two years and she's stayed in touch with me or comments when I comment on her stuff or I've used her in the past and she continues to remember my birthday or my anniversary of moving into the house or sends yeah. me a Christmas card Personal every year. Things. Those personal things to where That's right. they're showing me that they value our relationship as a whole, not just right. as a client. So this anything else before theory. we, <laughs> great theory, anything else that we want to say before we move into tactically, what does it look like to define my audience? Yeah. Some super practical advice on how do I just do this? Start off with, who do you already have? Who is your current client base? Uh, are there any similarities that they all possess? Is there any trend within the group of people that you have already served? What can you uh, figure out about your already current audience? And then double down on that. Yep. I think that's super important. There's always going to be a trend there's always going to be outliers as well. So there's your caveat for this point that we're making. But <laughs> in general, it's safe to say that you're going to notice a commonality. It might be houses within a certain price range that you're typically selling or um, you're just super knowledgeable about this little area of Franklin, Tennessee. And that just tends to be where you sell houses because you know so much about that area that it's super helpful to people looking to move there. Are um, your clients a certain age range? Are they in a certain financial bracket? Right. Um, yeah. All these, all these things are really, really good. Do they <laughs> believe the certain thing? Do they, you know, all eat at a certain restaurant? Right. Find those, find are those all, things. All those things. And like we said, because we know there are legal issues. We know that you're going to serve anyone, but in order for you to craft messaging that talks really about your strengths, this is why it's important to know these things because you will know, Oh, I'm really good at X, Y, and Z. And I know that because I have this history of serving people that tell me I'm good at that. So, so a little self-examination, yeah, figuring out who, who you serve well, is going to really, really help. Exactly. So both and look at yourself, look at your audience. Next, stay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Next stay um, up on local trends and the market, which you're already doing if you're good at your job, especially in Nashville. But look at the data. 
Nashville, for example, is experiencing a boom of people that are moving here from out of state and from coastal regions of the country. So East Coast, West Coast people are finding Nashville to be a happy little medium. It's centrally located. Um, Nashville, the Nashville region as a whole might have values that they feel are important to their families. So just knowing why this huge group of people is moving to the mid-state region is very important, but also um, how Nashville is an expression of those values they're looking for is important. And you might say, oh, you're really going to enjoy, you know, this area of town because it's really walkable. So you're coming from this place in California that has a really walkable local community. And so I think you're really going to enjoy the Sylvan Park area because you can walk to local restaurants and there's a little grocer and a florist and all the things that you could technically walk to from your home if you wanted to. So it's just knowing those core values of the people and why they're moving the motivation. Is it job related or is it they're just looking for a different place to raise their kids? Um, so that's, that's another tip on identifying potential niche audiences that you would want to serve and then crafting ways to communicate that you understand those needs would be how you target that audience. So knowing your competitors next. Yep. We've talked about this a ton already, but you've got to know who your competitors are serving. And if you are going to compete with those competitors or you're going to avoid those competitors. So are you going to double down on what they are doing and trying to go after the same people? Or you say, you know, that that agent has that corner of the market. I'm going to stay clear and I'm going to try to figure out a different spot. But you've got to, again, self-examination examining who your competitors are um, and identifying the gaps. Um, that's where you might be best. Exactly. I think you just made that point really well. So I'm not going to harp on it, but the gaps might be where your strengths are. And that's really an opportunity for you. And as we have said before, I think the Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs example applies again. Those are all men who have a lot in common. Um, they're in the tech space sort of different sectors of that space, but they still have an, a lot of overlap in what we would consider. So if you name any one of those three people, it probably brings to mind a general area of the world that they operate in. But then if you kind of dig deeper, you realize, oh, here's where Steve Jobs is really strong or was, you know, and the and design and how it's beautiful. And that's not just visually or aesthetically, but in just the design of how something works being beautiful. That's why people love using the systems he's created because they're very intuitive and easy to understand versus Jeff Bezos, who really looks at uh, the retail segment and redefining how people shop and, um, and those things. So there's different segments of that pie. Everyone has a place. They're all successful in their own right. We would not say that any one of those men are not successful. So it's just who that they're targeting and what they're offering is is a little different. Okay. And in the same way, we've talked about those guys as personas. So you've got to create your own persona then. So you've identified your group. You've identified the audience that you're going to serve. Now, who is the persona that is going to serve that group best? And that's what you've got right. to develop your social media and marketing into. Right. So a good example of this might be examining what stage of life you're in. So maybe you're someone whose kids are grown, they're um, getting married or they're off to school. And do you really understand the people about five years younger than you who are about to go through that same phase of life. And so you can give those personal like, yep, totally been here. You don't need the house that someone with a three and five year old needs. You really want to start thinking about five and 10 years down the road. What's going to serve your family the best. Is it a master bedroom on the main floor? Because you don't want to have to think about stairs in the next 15 years, if it's long-term house that you're buying. Um, but you want to have extra bedrooms because your kids might come home with their 
spouses and families soon. So let's let's look at houses that really meet that need. I get what you're looking for. I'm there myself. That's a persona. Or maybe it's, oh, go ahead. Commonalities ahead, and similarities. People love yeah. to, to be in common with their realtor, for sure. Yeah. In the same way, I was going to say, if I'm a young professional that wants to live downtown, you might not be the realtor for me. I might just be in my late 20s looking to be out with friends a lot. I don't want a lot of upkeep. I want to live in a, a condo high rise in downtown because that just makes the most sense for me. So I might not go to someone out in the no suburbs. It makes no sense for me, but man, <laughs> do I want that. I would love that. Same. It sounds like a lot of fun, but I'm not sure that anyone would appreciate what I would bring to that building at the moment because our <laughs> life is loud, <laughs> loud and crazy and not in the like super fun, loud and crazy way. And then like kids fighting in the back seat of the car way, but um, two different personas, two different pieces of the pie, lots of people that can be served in both. So that's what we mean by niche and persona. That's right. Okay. And then just to keep exploring. So you're going to keep shifting and tweaking both your audience and your persona. So never stop learning, never stop exploring. Um, sometimes we say, nope, this is what I am. This is who I serve. This is what, but if you don't continue to evolve and change as a person, as a realtor, then you are going to be left with uh, an audience that doesn't need you anymore. So continue to learn all the time. Uh, we should probably do a separate episode on why that's important. So I'm noting that, but it really is important to self-evaluate and that's in just your personal, do I even love what I'm doing right now? Do I love the way that I'm doing it? But also, am I doing this the best way? So I think we get so, um, ingrained in doing our daily routine that we just do it because it's almost like a survival thing. Sometimes it's just like that. I get up and I know that that's a thing. And there's so many things that are unpredictable, but this is a little segment of my life that I can control. But if you don't evaluate, you might realize I have been wasting a colossal amount of time, or I don't even like this particular thing. And yet I've done it the past year and a half, just because that's the way I've quote, always done it. And we just miss a lot of opportunity That's for right. betterment when we never take time to just think. And sometimes that has to be intentional. Like you have to sit down and schedule time to evaluate things. To make yeah, I mean, you, you see a, a ton of great leaders that do this. Uh, you know, Bill Gates comes to mind with his week of reading that he goes off and reads a thousand books in a week or something ridiculous. And so we all need to schedule, you know, maybe it's, an afternoon a month, or maybe it's one week a year, um, whatever rhythm and schedule you need to be in, but we all need to be evaluating for sure. Yeah. Really, really great discussion about target audience and how to uh, acquire a better one. Do we get to end with another fun question? We do. We that's do. What we do here. We do. I'm going to ask it today. Because okay. I said so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have to buy season tickets for one of the local sports team. Which one is it and why? I know what you're going to say, and it's not going to be the same answer as mine. But you uh, go this first. is a new fun game. Uh, what do you think mine will be? Soccer. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> you why? Think you know so. me. Um, have you been to the soccer game yet? Nope. That's why right there, hundred percent. So they are so much fun. Uh, now I grew up playing soccer and I played soccer for a lot of years. And so I understand the game. Um, however, being in the stands is so much fun. Um, so the first game I went to, I went with some dear friends and they were in the sit down and watch the game seats, which is delightful because they were, you know, midfield and we saw the game and we scored lots of goals. And then I said, you know what, guys, I see that section over there that's just having a party and they are the ones chanting and they're the ones that are screaming. It's like second half, we need to go over there. And 
somehow I convinced them to go over there and it was a different experience. It was so much fun. Both, both halves were fun in their own right, but yes, Nashville SC all day. Where would you go? Preds, hands down. I love hockey. Similarly, I think probably the environments are are similar in the way that people, it's, there's just like a camaraderie that you have when you're at the game with thousands of people you don't know. And even the same, like I think it's more fun at the hockey games to be even in the nosebleeds with people that are up and yelling and really excited than in a box, which I've done both. I mean, it's nice to be in the box seats, but it is not as much fun. Um, I think my kids love it too. So there's a lot of family fun that we have <laughs> for better or worse. If I laugh only because if you've been to a Preds game, you know what I mean by that <laughs> family friendly. <laughs> to, I what, mean, what are those chants? Go once and yeah. <laughs> use your own judgment. Um, but a lot of fun. It's fast paced. I like fast paced sports better than those that are slower, which also spend a lot of my life in, but definitely definitely the preds i will say and i can't even believe i'm going to say this but the sounds Mm -hmm. have a great family experience Mm -hmm. for sports they have done um the new baseball stadium really well there's a lot of things around the stadium a lot of very kid-friendly things so if you're a person who's trying to find a sporting event that is great for your family the sounds. I say that I'm just, my whole life is baseball and I really don't think I'm being hyperbolic. It's not my favorite sport, but, but I'm, I love watching my kids play and succeed. That is fun. Even if it is not the sport I would personally want to play or watch all the time. We've got a lot of great sports teams and a lot of great activities to do in and around Nashville. So yeah. um, find your, again, find your audience, find your niche. And exploit it. Have so much fun. I feel like we should just give a plug to the Titans. I think those are the last pro people we didn't talk about. They're great. They're apparently going to get a new-ish or brand new stadium arena. What is it? Stadium. Um, I don't know. That'll probably be a lot of fun. I mean, it would be fun to go see how it changes after that is built. I have no idea what the timeline is on that. I know they've announced it this year that that is in the works. And the, those games the are really fun when, <laughs> when the Dallas Cowboys come in. That's the only reason why I like them. Uh, and Go Cowboys. there's the Texas. Yeah. There's the Texas. Okay. Well, before well, Andrew gets for, started on how much better Texas is, let's wrap this up. Oh, we can do several <laughs> episodes on how much better Texas is, right? Uh, we could. We could, yeah. but we won't. <laughs> thanks for joining us uh kangaroos the podcast we provide incredibly local content for our incredible local realtors and we'll see you next time <laughs>